Hi everyone, I am super excited to present a new series masterclass that I am starting on the Sicilian Dragon. This is going to be part one of a nine part masterclass where we will cover everything you need to know to go from no knowledge on the Sicilian Dragon to being better than almost all of your competition. The first seven chapters are going to be theory based where we will look at the theory of the opening and for all of those I will include a PGN that you can then import into Lee Chess, Chessable, Chess Space so you can get uh, familiar with the moves on your own and study them. The video after that will be a tactics video where we'll talk about the common tactical motifs that exist in this opening so you can be very well prepared in tactical scenarios. And the final video will be a model game section where I will just be sharing many instructive model games that tie everything that you just learned together. The first video today is going to be an introduction where I will briefly go over the theory uh, and also touch upon the strategy that both players are trying to employ. And it will just basically get you ready and set up for the remainder of the series. One thing I do want to talk about now is how you should use this series. If you truly want to go ahead and understand the dragon, what I recommend is, of course, to watch all the videos, but to specifically memorize the theory of only the first uh, two theory-based videos, because those are the two critical, and I'll touch upon this when we go ahead and briefly look over them in the video today, but those are the ones that you really want to have an emphasis on. The other ones, uh, although feel free, of course, to study the moves, it's more about getting an understanding and feel for the position because it's less critical the moves you play and there's going to be more natural moves and in general more opportunities for you uh, to play good moves. Whereas in the uh, first two, they're very critical and you really have to know your theory because otherwise it's not going to work out for you well. And then the final thing I want to mention is the length of this series. Uh, overall, I think it will be somewhere between one hour and 30 minutes to two hours, something like that. Um, but obviously not all the videos are going to be the same. So the two, the first two theory based videos, the one that I mentioned, you probably want to memorize because they're critical. Those videos are going to be much longer. The other videos that talk about really rare sidelines uh, or sidelines that are just not dangerous at all, those might be five minutes, maybe six, seven minutes. And so not everything is going to be evenly spaced. And so, you know, you might be looking at the list of uh, episodes and, and seeing how it's so long, but some of them are really just five, six, seven minute videos that give you a really powerful weapon to crush these sidelines. And so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the dragon. Now the dragon is of course stemming from the Sicilian, so c5 after e4, and now knight f3. I mean, of course they can deviate at all times. They can play c3 here, they can play a number of moves, they can play d4 immediately. I'm not going to be looking at those. Um, I mean, again, here they can play the closed Sicilian, for example, but we're going to be starting um, in this position after g6. This is kind of the starting position, and from here, once you finish the course, you're really going to know a lot more than your opponent. Now, this is where you have to make your uh, major choice. Uh, a6 is a common move, g6, you can move your e-pawn as well. This is where you have to commit to some extent. So I'm recommending the move g6, which is the dragon. Uh, the reason that this dragon system is so powerful is that the pawn structure is really safe and solid. There's really no weaknesses here. When you play the move a6, uh, your intentions, of course, b5, you're creating some uh, weaknesses. These dark squares become immediately weakened. Once you play b5, you create, for example, a6 as a weakness. Are they very targetable weaknesses? Not necessarily, but it's still long-term weaknesses, meaning if you go into some endgame, there's going to be some targets for your opponent to try to take advantage of. When we play the move g6, none of that exists because this pawn structure is incredibly solid and safe. The only weaknesses are really f7 and e7, um, but they're not accessible. I mean, f5 is uh, not, not usable by the knight. This square is rarely accessible as well. And so these pawn weaknesses are so close to our base that it's impossible for white to really make any sort of 
uh, attack against these weaknesses. This is where the strategy comes from. If we get into some end game where we trade a ton of pieces off, we're going to have a really solid game because of the fact that our pawn structure is so safe, whereas white will have some clear weaknesses. Namely, the c2 pawn is a huge one. Um, and for that reason, white often tries to avoid moves such as bishop e2, which is a classical, or bishop c4, which I'm also going to cover, and basically just castles short. Because after something like this, we just get into some normal position where we're just going to develop our pieces, trade as many pieces off as possible, and again, if we get into some middle game with little pieces or end game, our pawn structure is going to guarantee equality, if not more. And so for that reason, white tries to avoid um, these variations where they castle short and just go into an, a position where we're happy to just trade pieces until an endgame. Instead, they recognize that if they don't do anything, our position of uh, our placement of pawns is going to be really powerful. So what they try to do is play the move bishop e3, which is the Yugoslav attack. And es essentially, what they try to do is to attack us immediately with h4, h5, g4, g5, castling long, of course, so the king is safe. And they're saying, I'm not going to go into a middle game uh, or an end game with little pieces on where your pawn structure is safe. I'm going to keep as many pieces on the board and start an immediate attack. And this system is the reason why initially um, and for a long time, the dragon was not seen as a usable opening. Um, and although even now it's not so popular, every player in the top level has tried it out. I mean, Magnus has games, Caruana has games, Anish Giri has games, everyone has games in this opening. It is definitely usable. Um, but that is the strategy for both sides. We're happy to go into some endgame where a pawn structure is superior. They're um, going to try to avoid that by castling long and creating imbalances and just attacking quickly uh, so they don't get into that endgame position. And one more thing that I really wanted to clarify is that everything I've talked about so far has been positional based, meaning this pawn structure. But don't get me wrong, the dragon is full of tactical complications. And when we get a bishop onto g7 and they go for the most critical line with Yugoslav attack and they try to attack us quickly, we do the exact same thing on the other side. We take out our queen to a5. We launch our pawn b5, b4, eventually also the a pawn. We get a rook onto the c file. You will see this in the model game section uh, as well as in the theory chapters. This is definitely an aggressive um, and ambitious opening. It's not some positional opening, uh, but that's one of the side benefits is the positional factors as well. Uh, the final thing I want to touch upon before we start entering uh, some of the theory is that don't get too attached to this pawn structure. I mean, chess is a game where you have to trade off one of your um, advantages into another or transform your advantage. And so our, our pawn structure advantage is definitely um, very powerful, but there's cases where we play d5 to get a space advantage or to get more control in the center. And so there's going to be cases where you're going to have to push one of your pawns. Um, and although you might be creating some weaknesses, you're transforming your positional uh, pawn structure into some other positional factor like space or center control. Uh, so that's kind of the strategy. White is looking to castle long and attack immediately. We're looking um, to just develop our pieces. We're happy to trade. If they castle short, then we have a really comfortable game. And if they castle long, then you do have to memorize some moves. Those are the two critical chapters that I hinted on that you're probably going to just want to spend some time uh, memorizing because as I showed, these attacks um, are definitely powerful, and so you want to be able to disarm them. So now let's start uh, touching upon the theory. Obviously, I'm not going to cover this in depth. I'm just going to kind of lightly cover all of the sidelines, all the variations that I'm covering in this course. And so if there's some move that maybe you're not sure about um, and you want to check if I'm going to be covering it, uh, let, let me go ahead and show you what I'll look at. Of course, the Yugoslav attack which I showed earlier, this is going to be the main chunk of the theory of the course. It's going to be the next two chapters, it's going to be the longest two chapters, and it's going to be the two most critical chapters that, it, once again, you want to uh, memorize. Um, the first thing about this 
please do not make the mistake of playing knight g4 here, which loses a piece after check, uh, because we have to block, and now the bishop is pinned, and queen takes knight, wins a piece. The idea is correct. We want to get rid of this bishop. If we can trade these two pieces, again, we're happy to trade because of the pawn structure, but more than that, it's even deeper because this bishop is really powerful because it's trying to go to h6 and trade for our really powerful bishop. So the idea is correct, but the execution not so much. But if we are given a chance, let's say, just for explaining this, they make some horrible random moves, I don't even know, whatever. Now suddenly the move knight g4 is really powerful. And so if we do have a safe way to try to trade these bishops, go for it. But definitely don't fall into that trap. So what do we play instead? Uh, we, of course, play after bishop to e3. We play bishop g7. Now here, if they were to go to queen d2, then suddenly this becomes really powerful. Again, they, their queen doesn't touch it, and if we have a safe way to attack the bishop, we do it. So to avoid this, the theory is f3 here, and they are simply trying to control. f3 is not a move they want to make. It's a necessary one because they want to secure this bishop. Here we continue by castles. Now they go queen d2, and again, what they're looking at uh, what they're looking to do is not give us an endgame, uh, a pleasant one, instead attack viciously. We continue by playing knight c6. We're simply developing super logical. This is where the knight wants to be. Now, this is where the breakoff happens. They have two options. They can either castle long here or play bishop c4. Each come with their own advantages. Castling long, of course, the king gets immediately safe, and now they're just prepared to launch these pawns. Against this, um, we play the move d5, and we take advantage of the fact that they didn't put their bishop here. The idea is, our attack, although one that we will be looking to play even in these lines, doesn't come fast enough right now. If we try to immediately attack with queen a5, which is a logical move, um, then after they begin to attack, their attack will come faster. And so to meet their attack on the side, we strike in the center, d5, we grab space. Now here there's a number of options they can play. Uh, there's queen to e1, there's king to b1, queen to e1, by the way, to make the rook now suddenly look at the queen. Uh, king to b1, uh, the king typically comes here uh, for various reasons to defend the pawns, to make the queen no longer connected to the king, which comes into play as you'll see in future videos, because when we take their queen, it doesn't come with check. This will be making sense in future videos. Um, they can simply take in, in any way. They can take first here. They can take first here and just trade. None of these are really scary. Um, against queen to e1, for example, we continue by striking immediately. We go e5, and after their knight moves, we continue even with d4. Um, against some of these other variations, we enter some interesting positions. So I'll show you one more. For example, after knight takes c6, Pawn takes, this is the main line, by the way. We play uh, knight takes, knight takes. Now, it might be, it might seem like we're losing a pawn, which we actually are, uh, but the idea is that now our bishops are going to be insanely powerful. If they get greedy and take the rook, we now play bishop f5, and we're threatening checkmate, we're threatening the queen, they have to take here. This is playable, and you're probably going to reach this endgame in, in many of your games, um, and I will cover this endgame, of course, in much more depth in the actual dedicated video for it. Uh, but this, just as an overview, is really pleasant for us. Um, we have a ton of imbalances, of course, a queen for two rooks, but our bishops are just 10 times better than theirs. And so we attack along these files and something eventually will happen. Um, and so that's one option. Of course, they don't have to trade. They can, for instance, play queen c5, which is uh, another variation and here we go, queen to b7. I'm obviously now starting to, to get into to more of the heavy theory. Um, but for the most part, this is just a, a playable uh, position for white, but typically pleasant for us because our bishops open up really quickly and powerfully, and they lack development. They're not prioritizing it. Um, and so these are basically the variations that occur after they castle in the Yugoslav attack. They can, of course, additionally play bishop c4. And their idea is to restrict the move d5, and now they want to castle and launch our attack when our strike in the center has been halted. 
Um, now here, the by far the more popular option is bishop d7. And this is totally fine. Uh, if you don't like my recommendation, which I think you definitely will like, but if you don't, then research this line. I mean, this is totally playable as well. Uh, although I do think that this is one of the reasons that at the top level, the dragon has lost its popularity. Uh, of course, if you're not at the top level, this doesn't really matter much because no one's going to memorize uh, and be able to refute this uh, to 100%. But this is, I don't think, the most uh, accurate. Instead, I like this relatively new and creative approach, uh, which is rather simple. We essentially say that this bishop is really powerful. Our bishop, when it comes to d7, it's not as powerful. We want our bishop to come to e6. Of course, if we play this now, this loses uh, immediately because this is just game over. So instead, we take the knight first, and after bishop takes, now we go bishop e6. Now you might be wondering, well, isn't there a clear problem? They're going to wreck our pawn structure. And this is definitely one of the viable variations that they have, but this is actually really double-edged because although the pawn structure is weakened, there's two factors that make this position, I think, really, really pleasant for black. The first is we open up the f file. Now, why does this matter? Are we not going to attack their king on the king side once they castle long. Well, that is definitely one of the ideas, but in this new variation, there's actually something really unique. We can attack on both flanks. And whenever they try to attack with h4, g4, h5, etc., we're going to be able to move this knight and target f3 and therefore attack on both sides of the board. Uh, so although you probably will still see this, this is not the main variation for that very reason. They don't want to give us this f file. So alternatively, bishop b3 is played here. Um, from here, we continue with queen a5, and we're just trying to attack. If they ever take at a later date, it doesn't really change anything. We still have this open f-file. And if they don't, uh, then often this bishop even comes under attack because eventually we also push this pawn, and we're going to use this bishop for tempo. And so this is a really fresh, uh, creative, and pleasant way to play this position. So those are the Yugoslav attacks, the most critical by far, because if you don't play the move that I'm showing, in some cases, that is going to be incredibly, um, incredibly detrimental. I mean, they're going to have their attack, and if you make a mistake, you lose one tempo, you move the bishop one wrong square, then that could be uh, the difference between a really good position to a totally lost one. This is not necessarily true for if they do something else. If they don't go for the Yugoslav attack, and if they play, for example, the classical with bishop e2. This position is much more calm in nature, which is why uh, it's precisely the reason why I don't necessarily think you need to memorize the moves 100%, uh, as long as you watch the video and more understand the strategy and the ideas that we're going for. So here, after they castle, uh, we're going to castle as well. Um, and for the most part, the ideas are simple. Uh, we're going to develop our knight, we're going to develop our bishop somewhere as well. Again, we're happy to trade because this pawn structure is better for us. Obviously, I go more in depth in the actual dedicated chapter, but there's nothing to worry about here because there's no way for them to attack us. And so we're just getting into that middle game end game position that I've talked about previously. So this is the classical. It's definitely a, a viable option, but it's just not that dangerous. Now, there's this one option called the Levenfish system, which is playing f4 here. It looks really dangerous. It also has its own name, and so you might be really scared of this one. It's not dangerous at all. The one thing you must remember, though, don't play bishop g7 here. Although it is playable, then they can execute their idea of e5. First play knight to c6, stopping e5, um, and then you have nothing to worry about. Of course, they can still try to take here and then go with e5, but in the dedicated video, I show you how to deal with that. It's not dangerous at all. It just looks relatively dangerous. But uh, in a five, six, seven minute long video, you're going to know exactly how to deal with and disarm f4. Uh, additionally, I mean, aside from that, they can go g3, which is the Fianchetto system. They're trying to get their bishop here immediately. And instead of, of developing it in the more classical ways, they're trying to put it on this long diagonal. Again, it's not dangerous because their mentality here is a more passive one in nature. They're not going for this long attack. They're going to castle short and just develop normally. 
uh, we do the same. I mean, we play bishop g7, they play bishop g2, castles, castles, and we just develop. And as with, uh, you know, the other positions that I've shown um, in the past, in the last couple of lines, it, we're just looking to trade, develop our pieces, the queen will come out, the bishop can come out, maybe to g4 to invoke f3, um, and then drop back either to d7, once we trade, it can come to e6 as well, the rooks come to the c file, we just develop and play a game of chess. Of course, I do go a bit more in depth in the dedicated video, but it's not actually much uh, more that I can say. I mean, this is just a, a much calmer position, um, and it's not really what white wants to do when they play against the dragon, because black just totally equalizes and gets a totally comfortable and playable position. Um, now, aside from g3, there's, of course, other options. I mean, there's bishop c4, there's bishop to g5, and there's bishop to b5 check, all of which I cover in the final theory-based chapter, which is sixth move sidelines. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I'm missing any move here, but I think, unless I am doing a, a huge, huge mistake here, I think that's about it. I mean, we have the classical, the Levin fish, the fianchetto, and we have these random sidelines that I'm also going to be covering, and then the main chunk of this course that, again, you really want to have an emphasis on the Yugoslav attack, both videos on that. So that's, for the most part, going to cover the theory of this video. Again, as a reminder, I'm going to have the PGN in the description for all of these videos, and so if you want to put that into Lee Chess, Chessable, Chess Base, uh, etc., feel free to, and then study your moves that way. Now, the, the video following the theory-based videos is going to be all about tactical tricks and motifs that exist in the Yugoslav, or in the dragon, um, in the dragon opening. There's one that you sacrifice your knight and use your powerful bishop to take back the piece in the center, things of this nature. So I cover all of these tactical motifs that you're probably going to see in a, a big chunk of your games in that video. And the final video is the model game section where we're going to look at the, the dragon in action in the top level to really get a feel for this opening. So hopefully this masterclass serves you well. I really structured it in a manner that I would have wanted to learn a new opening. If I wanted to learn a new opening, I would have first wanted to get some of the theory out of the way and then look at some of the tactics that exist and finally end it, tie it all up with some nice model games. So hopefully you enjoyed this video and look forward for the rest of the masterclass. Subscribe if you're new around here, like this video if you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the future videos. See you next time. Peace out.